a reading. And uh, I've told you this before, that a lot of times the readings I use as supplemental, um, I'll use those as if something's going on, current events that we need to speak of um, and see what God's Word says, we'll use it for that. And then sometimes when we've been in uh, a particular book of the Bible or particular chapters that have been heavy on judgment, 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 wrath, wrath, wrath. Sometimes we need a little bit of encouragement. Even though there's encouragement for us as believers within those, sometimes it's nice to just have straight up encouragement, right? So that's what we're going to use since we have a little bit of a shorter sermon today. We have a little bit longer of a reading and the reading is to encourage you. So before I get to the reading, I have a question for you. And uh, you don't have to shout the answer out loud, but I hope you know the answer. Does Jesus get his prayers answered? What do you think? Do you think that when Jesus prays a prayer, do you think that that prayer is answered? And do you think it's always answered? Nod your head up and down. Yes. Always. It's Jesus. He's the Son of God. He's God. Of course his prayers are always answered. So... Jesus' prayer is always answered. So remember that as I read to you portions of, or a portion of Jesus' high priestly prayer found in John 17. And the whole time I'm reading this, in the back of your mind, you should be remembering that, wait a minute, Jesus is God and everything he prays for gets answered. Always. Perfectly. So, keep that in mind while I read this. This is John 17, verses 9 through 24. So, Jesus is praying to the Father, and he says, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. So, this is a prayer that Jesus is praying to the Father, specifically for those he came to save, both then and now, at the time he's praying it, and Today, all the way up until our age and until he comes back, this prayer is for all believers, okay? So Jesus says, I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world. This isn't for everybody. This is a specific prayer that Jesus is praying for his people, believers. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. This tells us that long before conversion, they belong to God. A sheep doesn't a goat doesn't become a sheep. A sheep is always a sheep. So long before conversion, they belong to God. And that's true because of God's election chosen before the foundations of the world, Ephesians 1:4. When their names were written in the Lamb's book of life that we see referenced in Revelation 17. Jesus goes on in his prayer. He says, and I am no longer in the world. This is right before Jesus knows he's going to be crucified, buried, and rise again. And he says, I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name. So he's praying for his disciples. The whole time that he's leading up to his crucifixion, Jesus is preparing his disciples and apostles for what's to come. That's what kind of God we have. He takes care of us and provides for us. Before we even know what we need, he is providing it. Just like he did for the apostles and disciples here. But this prayer, you'll see, goes beyond that and includes us too. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name. That Jesus prayed the prayer, God, keep those you have given me in your name. So what do you think that's going to mean if God answers every one of Jesus' who is, who is also God's prayers? That you will absolutely be kept. You will be kept. Not because you're so great or you're so strong or you're so faithful, but because Jesus and God is strong and faithful. And that he prayed that you will be kept. Therefore, that prayer will be answered and you will be kept. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. One day we will be one. Oh, we're going to be one. And not with just each other, but with God. That's a prayer of Jesus, which is obviously going to be answered. That's going to happen. Guaranteed. 
While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one has been lost except the son of destruction or perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. He's referring to uh, Judas there. And Judas wasn't a failure on Jesus' part because Jesus foreknew that that was going to happen. It was all to fulfill Scripture. This also tells us that Jesus protects those he comes to save. Isn't that wonderful? He didn't just save you, he protects you. Sanctifies you. Keeps you. He keeps them his apostles and disciples, he kept them safe from the world, as he said. So you, you are held forever secure in the arms of Christ. Again, this is Christ's high priestly prayer in John 17. And again, I remind you, ask yourself the question, do, does Jesus, when he prayed, does his prayers get answered? And immediately you say, well, yeah, of course. Of course, every single one, yes and Amen. So if that's true, everything in this high priestly prayer is going to come to pass. Every single thing. So now, listen to this. This is verse 13 in John 17. But now I am coming to you. Jesus is now, I'm coming to you, Father. I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again. I'm going to ascend to heaven. I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So that's also a little indicator there that true believers, those who are really Christ's, won't be like the world. You'll look at them and you'll look at the world and you'll say they are not the same. You will stand out. You will be different. It will be obvious. And when I say the world, I don't mean like, oh, well, I love trees and I love rivers and I love mountains. So I love the world. Am I in danger? No, it's talking about the worldly system. The worldly system, the satanic worldly system is what's being talked about there. So don't love the world because the world is at enmity with God. You can love God's creation. That doesn't mean you love the world's system. So you're going to be totally set apart from the world. You're going to be totally different from it. And because of that, the world will hate you just like it hates Jesus. Now, Jesus says this, right? He says, I have given them your word. The world has hated them because they're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So expect to be hated. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. So Jesus doesn't say, hey, take away all hard times, all tribulation, all troubles. I don't ask for that. I ask that God will help you endure that he will protect you from Satan and all the wicked forces of evil that follow him. And Jesus defeats uh, Satan and death on the cross. He makes a way outside of the evil system that seeks to destroy Jesus and believers and the gospel. But God is our strong protector. So even though you are in in the midst of a world that hates you and a system that hates you and hates the one you love because he first loved you, even though you're in the middle of that system, you know that you are protected and kept by God himself. And you have that assurance because Jesus Christ himself is asking the Father to do this for him, to do this for you, for him. And all of Jesus' prayers are always answered. Always. He goes on in verse 16. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Notice it doesn't say, sanctify them in truth. Your feelings are truth. No, it doesn't say that. God's word is our source of truth. It comes from the maker of truth. The source of all truth is God. And his word breathed out to us is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. You're in the world right now. None of us are living in a monastery, cutting ourselves off from the world. You're in the world right now. The people that you bump into at Dollar General, the people at your work, the people at the play, the people everywhere. We have been sent into the world for the gospel of Christ, to share with them what has been shared with us, to testify to the life-changing Um, ability of God's redemptive plan through the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
So he says, they're not of the world, I'm not of the world. Sanctifying them truth, them in the truth, your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. This is a guarantee that you will be sanctified, set apart for God, set apart, changed, set apart for a particular use. You're set apart for God's use, for God's purposes alone. That's the point. And by sanctifying you, he's changing you and I, making us to love what he loves and hate what he hates. And that transformation happens. You, he, he saves you and he regenerates you, right? He, he dips his finger into your heart and he stirs your soul. He regenerates you. He converts you and justifies you. Then he's in the, the business of the dirty work zone of sanctification, making you from the old creature into a new creature, changing your loves and your hates, making your will align with God's will. That's the dirty sanctification, sanctification zone. And that leads to glorification. When Christ comes back or we go home to see him, whichever happens first, that's when you're glorified. When the perfect work of God is completed, is there. Philippians 1, 6. Sanctification is accomplished by truth, God's truth, revealed to us in Christ and in his word. He says, I sanctify myself so that they also might be sanctified in the truth. What Christ means there is that I have totally set myself apart for the Father's will in order that believers might be set apart. None of us could do what God requires. None of us could be sanctified if it wasn't for what Christ did in his own life, sanctifying himself by setting himself apart for the Father's will. What he accomplished by doing that allows us to be sanctified. See? That's why he says, I sanctify myself so that they might be sanctified. If Christ didn't do what he did, none of us could be redeemed. None of us could be regenerated, converted, justified, sanctified, and glorified. That's why Jesus says, I sanctify myself. I set myself apart for us. Oh. I mean, I hope you're understanding this, that how great of a promise that is, that you will be sanctified. It's not you might, you will. This is the blessed assurance that we stand upon. That's why there's, there's th that fear is temporary when you realize all these great promises. What is there to fear? What can flesh do to me? What can all my circumstances in life do to me? What's the worst that can happen? I still have all of this. Now, here comes a really fun part. Verse 20. I do not ask for these only. I don't ask just for my disciples and my apostles only, but for those who will believe in me through their word. That's us. That's us. Jesus is praying this high priestly prayer for his disciples and apostles, and then he adds this beautiful addition in verse 20, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Those who believe in Christ through the words of his apostles. That's us. That's us. So that they may all be one, just as you, Father, in me, and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. That's the, that's the end game. And Jesus prays for it so it's going to happen. That we will be one. When you get to heaven, you won't be like, oh, there's so-and-so. I've got to try and hide behind this glowing bush so that they don't see me. I don't want to have that conversation with them. You don't have to worry about that stuff. Oh, I'm afraid I might say something the wrong way. You don't have to worry about that. It's all going to be perfect. Perfect. You're not brought back to the position that Adam and Eve were in. You are brought to a holy new place. You are holy and perfect. Never an opportunity for sin to ever come in. If you were made, if, if God's redemptive work just made you like Adam and Eve, that means that there's still potential for sin. But you're not made, the new person is not made after Adam. It's made after the new Adam, who is Jesus. And in Jesus, there was no sin, no darkness, no nothing at all. That's who we're made after in our new person. That's how you know that when his work of glorification is done, it's perfect, it's 100%. So when you get to heaven, there won't be any miscommunication, there won't be any arguments, there won't be any stress, anxiety, all that stuff is gone, just perfect 
unity with one another, and more importantly, perfect unity with God. Because there will be no more sin. Just perfect unity with Him, worship and perfect service of Him forever and ever and ever. We will be one. That's how so united that we will be. This isn't just a wish. This is a reality. The down payment of which comes by God's Holy Spirit that enters into us at the moment of faith. The moment of faith. That's your deposit. That's your seal. That's your guarantee. That that's going to happen. This isn't just we experience the same things and so therefore we have unity through that. But we have unity in the shared truth of Jesus Christ and the shared word and the shared presence of the Holy Spirit inside of all who believe. And we share in his life. Isn't that encouraging? I encourage you to take your time and go through Jesus' entire high priestly prayer. And the whole time you're doing it, you just say to yourself, I know this is going to happen because all of Jesus' prayers are answered. Every one of them. Verse 20, the glory that you have given to me, I am giving to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. You have God's Holy Spirit literally and actually inside of you. Proof that you will one day fully be with him. It doesn't matter what you're going through right now. That's the end. That's what's going to happen in the end. When you know that, you can endure anything, right? Because you know this is going to end. Whatever it is I'm enduring is only temporary. Because there is an end date. Now, if I told you that there's no end date, you're going to have to suffer. You're going to have a, you're going to have a horrible sunburn. And you say, well, how long? And you say, I don't know. You're just going to have a really horrible sunburn for I don't know how long. You'd say, oh, that sounds awful. And maybe when you're three months in, you might be wishing that you have a, you know, the next day you wake up and it's gone, but maybe it's not. And three years in, you're thinking, when is this ever going to end? And five years in, you're wondering and if I'm going to go mad because of the pain and the discomfort. How hard is it to, to hold on through difficult times when you don't know how long those difficult times are going to end or if they'll ever end at all? But how much easier and how blessed are we that our Lord tells us that there is an end no matter what troubles, trials, or tribulations that you're in right now, they will only last so long until he comes for you or you go to him. And when that happens, it's all done. Now I know that there's an end. There's an end to the, the difficulty. There's an end to that suffering and hardship. And now I look forward to that time to come, which then stirs me to service and stirs me to share with others with a sense of urgency the gospel of Jesus Christ that gives me those promises. How wonderful to know and have this 100% guaranteed promise that you're going to fully be with him one day, 100%. Not, not one person, well, I know, but maybe I won't be the one. Maybe I'm the one who won't be. No, no, quit thinking like that. God doesn't have any kind of legalese in this contract. It's, it's everyone that he saves. It's everyone. Father, I desire, verse 24, that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am. Yes, there it is. Isn't that what you long for? Don't you want to be with the Lord that you love? The one that you love because he first loved you? Isn't that where you want to be, where Jesus is? I just want to rest my head upon his lap and feel his warmth and his power and his love and his forgiveness and his mercy and his grace. I just want to be there. And this is my promise from Jesus himself that that will happen one day, not because of me, but because of him. Father, I desire that they also, remember, he's talking to all believers now, whom you have given me, all you have given me, that they may be where I am, heaven. To see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. To be where Christ is. To see him in heaven. To see his face. To hear his voice. To feel and see his full 
glory. Not only will you see his glory, but we're going to get to share in part of that too. That's how awesome his redemptive plan is. A filthy, wretched sinner like me. God's going to do this for me? Not because I'm so great, but because he's so great. So do Jesus' prayers get answered? Yes. Absolutely. There was never a prayer that Jesus prayed that doesn't get answered. He's our great intercessor. If all of Jesus' prayers are always answered, then what we just got done reading is for you, all of you, and me. Pretty encouraging. It's also encouraging to take one step further and say, if Jesus prayed this prayer because he knew that he wanted to provide and protect and encourage me, if he's that far thinking that he's praying for me, Over 2,000 years after this prayer is prayed, that prayer was for me and it's active today in my life. If he's so good and so wonderful in providing for those he saves in such a way as this, certainly he'll take care of everything else. Certainly everything else he'll take care of. He'll make sure that your needs are met. He'll make sure that you have a roof over your head, that you have clothes on your back, that you have food, that you have fellowship, that you have his truth. He's going to take care of you. He takes care of the birds. Certainly he'll take care of you. So this is great encouragement today. And it would be my prayer that God would help you remember these great assured promises in the future days when you need your spirit and your head lifted. You remember this. When you feel helpless, weak, fallen, when, when you feel like your world is caving in around you, there's just so much going on, the, the thing is spinning. Just stop, Jane, make it stop. Let me get off this crazy thing. You feel like that, you remember this, that we're in, perfectly in the hand of the God who holds everything in his hands. Please pray with me. Father, thank you for that encouraging word, and uh, thank you that you would pray for us. Uh, Jesus, thank you that you would pray for us, that you would know our needs before we even realize them and be meeting them through this prayer and through the work of you, Jesus, and your Holy Spirit, God. Father, you are good. We praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you for who you are and what you've done for us. Help us to be people of faith, people who trust in you, because we have seen time and time again your faithfulness, your steadfast love in your word, and your faithfulness and steadfast love in our own lives. Bless our time together today as we worship you, as we pray, as we study your word, and as we fellowship together with each other and with you. Bless our time, for we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.